introduce um, Anthony Midlake. Um, so Anthony uh, and I have some connections going back many years, many probably before we even knew. Um, so we actually grew up probably within about 20, 30 miles of each other uh, in Michigan. Um, Anthony went to, uh, did an undergrad, uh, I think in geology and geophysics department at Yale. Uh, after that, he went on to do his uh, PhD uh, and master's at the University of Washington um, in Seattle under uh, Bob House, uh, in which he spent a lot of time um, particularly looking at using radars and uh, numerical modeling, uh, focusing on, on rain bands and eye walls uh, in hurricanes. And I think we're going to do a little bit of that um, today. Uh, when he finished his PhD in 2012, he then moved um, into a fellowship uh, at NASA, where he worked for about three years. Uh, at NASA Goddard, just out by Washington, D.C., so not too far away, uh, until uh, a few years ago, um, I think two years ago now, when he started uh, as an assistant professor at uh, Penn State University. Um, so today he's going to talk about um, some kinematic and microphysical observations of rain bands and eye walls uh, in tropical cyclones. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, can you all hear me with the mic microphone? Are we good? Yes. All right, thanks, Kevin, and thank you to the department uh, for having me out here. Um, I'm really excited to share with you all uh, the work that, I guess this is going to be work that I've been doing for the last uh, 10 years now, um, and just trying to put it all together in a good story um, about uh, the kinematics and microphysics of uh, tropical cyclones. And so just for some motivation, um, this is a satellite uh, loop of Hurricane Harvey last year, or, yeah, last year. Um, here we can see the storm uh, as it's becoming more and more organized approaching uh, the land. Um, and we know that it became uh, pretty devastating uh, due to all of the flooding that occurred, but it also uh, made landfall as a category for a hurricane. So right now this was a minimal hurricane, um, and the forecast for Harvey was to, uh, sorry, here we go. Uh, Harvey was forecast to uh, intensify rapidly, um, but the, and the track forecast was pretty spot on in terms of where it actually went. It made landfall um, here at the Red Star. Uh, and all of these forecast models, though, uh, the maximum intensity for forecast ranged between a, a Category 1 hurricane to a mid Category 3 hurricane. And the actual uh, uh, for, uh, what actually happened was uh, way stronger than what all of these forecast models um, predicted. And so this demonstrates one of the key issues that we have in hurricane forecasting is that we're really good at telling you, uh, or we become better, I should say, at telling you where a storm is going to go. But uh, determining the intensity of the storm is something that um, forecasters uh, have a, a more difficult time doing. And that's mostly due to the fact that um, Intensity and also size of the storm is something that uh, we're trying to work on uh, in terms of uh, predicting very well. The thing is that uh, in, in, with track, there's a, a couple of factors like the environmental winds um, and uh, maybe the beta effect that impact where a storm is going to go. But there are more factors uh, that are also more complicated in terms of telling you how strong or how large a, a storm is going to be. And we can categorize these effects into basically two categories, um, the environmental factors, such as the ocean heat content, and the wind shear and uh, moisture content. Um, all of these uh, play a role in, in, in determining how strong the storm is going to be. And these are uh, factors, of course, of, due to the environment. But then we also have the internal dynamics of the storm. So when I say internal dynamics, I mean the, the evolution of these features. So we have the eye and the primary eye wall. In some storms, you can create a secondary eye wall. And then outside of that, we've got uh, the rain bands, uh, so primary, secondary, and outer rain bands. All of these also potentially have an impact on the storm intensity and size. And so understanding uh, their evolution um, is really important. And such processes that uh, play a role in this are uh, eye wall contraction, um, and then the rain bands have their own dynamics that are uh, pretty intricate. Um, and then some storms, of course, can create this secondary eye wall and undergo a, an eye wall replacement cycle, which has characteristic changes on the intensity um, and size. And so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the rain band dynamics and eye wall replacement cycles. Um, 
from a uh, cloud processes point of view so that we can understand what causes intent or what may impact intensity and size changes. So here's a satellite, or sorry, radar image of Hurricane Harvey. And you can see that um, as the storm was approaching uh, the coast, it, it created a secondary eye wall around the inner eye wall. And that eye, secondary eye wall replaced the inner eye wall. And the storm it rapidly intensified, but then uh, stopped intensifying for a few hours um, and then made landfall. So this secondary eye, or the eye wall replacement cycle actually has um, the char one characteristic change is that the vortex circulation actually expands. And eventually, the inner core rain band convection coalesces into that secondary ring. And that replacement um, occurs after that. And so what I'm also going to, what I'm going to focus on here is the formation of the secondary eye wall, which involves the expansion of the storm and the coalescence of the convection into that secondary ring. And in order to understand that coalescence, um, we need to understand the rain band dynamics um, that are occurring uh, prior to the formation of that ring. So in terms of secondary eye wall formation, it's something that we see uh, pretty regularly in um, intense storms. Uh, but there's really no consolidated theory as to why these storms create secondary eye walls. Um, there are several that have been proposed over the years, including uh, vortex Rossby wave dynamics. Um, there's also an upscale cascade of potential vorticity anomalies um, and interaction with the mean flow. And uh, we also uh, uh, debating in the, in the literature now uh, what role the boundary layer uh, plays in, um, in, in the formation of the secondary eye wall. Specifically, what does gradient wind balance uh, how important is gradient wind balance or, or imbalance um, to uh, any type of feedback mechanism for um, convection for the secondary eye wall? The thing about these theories is that they're all uh, mostly focusing on axisymmetric processes. So uh, when we talk about the evolution of the storm, it really is, um, it, th the storm does respond most to the azimuthal average. Um, whatever uh, the uh, heating or whatever feature is projected onto the azimuthal average is really important. And that's why a lot of these uh, processes, um, a lot of these uh, theories focus on axisymmetric processes. But in order to create something that's projected onto the axisymmetric mean, it has to first, uh, of course, uh, be very present um, on the plan view or looking at any type of asymmetric feature, uh, such as tropical cyclone rain bands. So these rain bands have their own um, dynamics and their own structures that prior to sufficiently projecting onto the axisymmetric axis mean um, are, are, are worthy of exploring if we really want to get to uh, what is catal what, what, what's the catalyst for uh, creating the secondary eye wall formation process. So the question I want to tackle is how and why exactly does the asymmetric rain band convection um, develop into a secondary eye wall? All right, so my objective um, of, of pretty much almost everything that I've done research on so far has been to uh, analyze the dynamics and microphysics of um, rain band convection and also to assess uh, its role in secondary eyewall formation. Here's a microwave image of one of the storms that I've studied, uh, Hurricane Gonzalo, where you can really see the um, really uh, heavy precipitation um, in the outer ring, outer eyewall, before it replaced that inner eyewall. So what I'm going to do is look at um, radar from the dual polarization uh, uh, WSR-88D network, um, specifically from 2014. I'll be showing a case study of uh, Hurricane Arthur. Um, and I'm also going to uh, look at a couple of other case studies from Hurricane Rita and Hurricane Earl, where we had airborne Doppler radar observations that documented um, both the kinematics and the precipitation structure um, of of two storms that underwent eye wall replacement cycles. All right, so first, um, I uh, wanted to overview a bit about um, the rain band complex uh, in tropical cyclones. So if you have a, a storm that's undergoing a, a environmental wind shear, so if we look at the wind shear within a deep layer, so the 850 to 200 millibar uh, wind shear vector, 
and you have a vector here that's pointing to the north, then the rain bands uh, typically organize into this uh, stationary band complex, is what we call it, um, where this complex uh, is pretty, uh, rel is pr remains relatively stationary to the center of the storm as it uh, tracks along in a specific direction, uh, but it remains aligned to the environmental wind shear vector. And that alignment, um, we have active generation of the convection in the right of shear. So this is our shear vector. So to the right, we have our convective uh, precipitation, where we have a lot of the generation um, of this uh, convection. And a lot of the ice that gets created into, uh, in this convection, uh, so we have very strong tangential winds, they get invected around to the other side of the storm and fall out as stratiform precipitation. Um, predominantly in the left of shear half. So we see this organization uh, time and time again um, it, when a storm has uh, sufficient wind shear. And so the question I, I want to pose, uh, look into is how does this impact uh, the, the, the evolution of the storm as, this, as these structures are their own internal dynamics and what does that play into the intensity and size changes? So a lot of recent studies, including mine, have uh, looked at this by dividing the storm into four different quadrants. So I'll be talking about this a bit. Um, so we have our downshear left quadrant, our upshear left, or UL, upshear right, or UR, and downshear right, or DR. So the first uh, step was. Um, or the first thing I want to show is some of the more recent uh, work that I've done uh, from Didley and Compton from last year, uh, where we uh, we now have with the dual polarization um, capabilities of our uh, our U.S. operational radar network, we have the capability of looking at um, a large expanse of uh, microphysical information using the dual pole network. Um, dual pole uh, or uh, microphysical information of observations of tropical cyclones is something that is pretty rare It's uh, in, in, the, in the past uh, 15 years. Um, usually you have aircraft that may like collect uh, the shape or sizes um, of, of different um, micro, micro hydrometeors in the storm. Um, and that's pretty much what we've learned in terms from observations of how the stru microphysical structure of the tropical cyclone uh, uh, is uh, created or how it looks. Um, but with this radar data, we're able to look at um, a, a large amount of data over time. And what I've done is I analyzed the bulk microphysics of uh, Hurricane Ar Arthur. So this was from 2014, as it uh, was a, it intensified to a Category 2 storm and became into range of three of the radars. Um, and what I did was I analyzed them according to their radio. Uh, rings. So we have our inner, our eye wall, our inner rain bands, and outer rain bands. And I analyzed them relative to the environmental wind shear, which is the blue line here, so dividing them into the quadrants, to get a sense of what uh, the bulk microphysical structures look like in uh, dual pole observations. And just for a quick overview, um, so dual polarization radar takes, um, uh, uh, takes the radar uh, uh, beam um, at two different orthogonal angles. So we have a horizontal uh, uh, beam, that uh, a horizontal pulse that gives you information on the reflectivity factor, or which gives you uh, the, the particle size and concentration, which is something that we uh, typically see with uh, pretty much all radars, is the reflectivity. Um, if you have polarization in the vertical as well, you can get a sense of and you can compare the backscatter from the horizontal and the vertical to get a sense of the shape or mean size and mean shape. And so one of the other variables that we look at a lot is differential reflectivity or ZDR. And so this tells us about the average shape of the particles. Um, and, and when you have uh, more horizontally aligned particles like these raindrops here, then the ZDR is greater than zero. And lastly, I'm going to examine uh, rho HV, which is correlation coefficient, which gives us uh, a, a sense of how diverse the hydrometeor shapes are within a, a certain uh, volume. 
So if you have a lot of uniformity, then your row HD is one. But if you have a lot of diversity in, of the shapes, uh, then you have a row HD that's less than one. So I'm going to show plots of these variables for uh, the four different quadrants um, for 30 hours worth of data. And so here, uh, the downshear right and the downshear left, um, you can see are the solid red and blue lines for reflectivity. And you can see that they're highest in the downshear quadrants uh, for uh, pretty much all of the altitudes, which makes sense as we know that that's where the bulk of the rain band complex is. What you also see is uh, bright band peaks for ZDR and Rho HV uh, that are due to the melting of the particles. So we see this in every quadrant, but the variances in these peaks can give us a sense of um, how much convective activity is within, that, uh, within each quadrant on average. So if we look at the width, the vertical width of these, specifically the downshear left and downshear right quadrants, you can see that the downshear right quadrant has a slightly higher ZDR and therefore a wider, uh, and, and it shows a wider um, peak in both ZDR and also with Rho HV, it's a wider peak as its Rho HV is slightly lowered um, above the, just above the melting level. And so this higher ZDR <coughs> uh, is, is cor it, it corresponds to this lower Rho HV which uh, we suggest um, is due to more um, pristine ice crystals, so such as columns that would fall with a more horizontally aligned um, orientation, which would cause, uh, which would trigger a larger ZDR. And when you have a, combina a larger combination of um, all of the, the other ice particles um, that can be created in this zone, then that also gives you a lower row HV. And within this zone, we also have uh, melting rind ice particles and larger drops that contribute to uh, these two signatures. So the thing about the, th this width is that it also gives us a sense of how much uh, vertical mixing is happening. So you can imagine that um, if you're creating in the convective zone a lot of uh, ice particles, um, both maybe frozen raindrops and also ice columns, which are the first habit that uh, generally is, is created uh, just above the melting level. Um, so uh, within a lot of vertical mixing, uh, you, you can create uh, this signal that becomes uh, more stretched in the vertical, which gives you uh, a, a wider peak for the bright band here for both, uh, par uh, for both profiles. So what we saw was that these profiles in the downshear right are relative to the downshear left are more consistent with convective processes um, due to the implication that there's more uh, vertical mixing uh, due to the vertical motion. Meanwhile, the downshear left quadrant um, has a narrower bright band peak, um, which uh, comes from uh, widespread snow aggregates that fall. Uh, the, the snow aggregates themselves gives you a, um, a lower uh, ZDR and uh, because there, if, if you have just snow aggregates in that layer, then that gives you a higher Rho HD and therefore higher, uh, lower diversity. And so once this, uh, these snow aggregates reach the melting level, um, they, uh, they have a, uh, they melt within a thin layer um, and therefore it gives you a, a peak, a bright band peak that is thinner in the vertical. So what we can see here is that that will be more consistent with stratiform processes as ice particles are, are more predominantly snow aggregates um, on this side of the storm. And so this is uh, what we'd expect when we look at uh, these two quadrants in the rain band complex. So focusing just on this level even more, um, looking at from 6.5 to 7.5 um, kilometers, uh, we can plot a, a, a density uh, plot here, just showing the 50% um, contour line of all of the, the data points within, the, this out, this, within this layer, showing the distribution between a ZH uh, signal and a ZDR signal. And what you can see is that 
within this range of 15 to 25 dBz um, for reflectivity, you have the downshear right quadrants generally have a larger, slightly larger ZDR than your downshear left quadrants. So when you go from the downshear right quadrant to the downshear left quadrant, for the same reflectivity, you have a decrease um, in, in ZDR. And this, again, uh, is likely due to ice, uh, columnar ice crystals, um, as the columns, because they're horizontally aligned, gives you a higher ZDR. Um, and this is uh, something that we see in the convective region more, um, whereas uh, when you go downwind to the stratiform region, aggregation is much more prevalent, and the aggregates uh, give you a, a lower ZDR. So just based on uh, the dual polarization observations, we were able to uh, confirm uh, what has been seen before, is that the downshear right tends to show more convective precipitation than the downshear left, whereas the downshear left is more stratiform. And so these are, again, expected locations for the, uh, the stationary band complex. And this is, was just one of the first steps in exploring the bulk microphysics of, of tropical cyclones, which is an uh, important aspect of understanding how the dynamics of these rain bands evolve because of the latent heat exchange that comes about with the different types of hydrometeors. So let's come back a little bit to um, to the rain band complex and its role in secondary eyewall formation. So uh, what, what uh, I've been proposing for a few years now is how important that this side of the storm is in terms of creating a secondary eyewall. So with uh, stratiform sectors, um, it's a pretty broad mesoscale feature. And because it's such a broad mesoscale feature, um, well, not because, but on this side of the storm, you also have a spiral. Uh, this is the end of this larger spiral that also tends to be more circular than your convective regions, which tends to have more of an uh, spir inward spiraling angle. Um, and as a result of the stratiform complex being broad and more circular, then that means that it's able to project uh, more strongly on, let's say, the axisymmetric uh, storm structure. And that projection onto the axisymmetric mean means that it has a, uh, it can potentially have a really important uh, role in, in affecting the overall vortex circulation and evolution. And several modeling studies have also shown the importance of the stratiform rain band processes um, in secondary eyewall formation. Specifically, here from Jean Guidal 2017, uh, the outer rain band uh, PV uh, is anomaly is pretty uh, large um, in the upper levels above the melting level. And this is where we tend to have, uh, in stratiform precipitation, more latent heating. So that gives you your PV anomaly. But over time, what happens is a top, what we call a top-down process of the uh, secondary eyewall formation where um, uh, where eventually some of this heating uh, gets interact, interacts with the boundary layer and it creates a more vertical, um, clear convective secondary eyewall in the axisymmetric point of view. So this is what they looked at in the axisymmetric framework. Um, what I'm going to look at is uh, things uh, that are averaged over sectors of the storm. And so this is data from Hurricane Rita in 2005 where the aircraft um, uh, flew around the storm and followed these features. And here, the wind shear vector was pointing uh, to the northeast. And this shows us where our stratiform rain band was, um, where you had more active convective cells on the right of shear half. And this was about 18 hours before uh, Rita uh, created a secondary eyewall. And again, this came from the RAINX field project, where we were actually able to follow these features, as opposed to um, flying in the regular figure four or butterfly patterns that are just typical transects across <laughs> the storm. All right, so the first thing I wanted to look at was to verify whether or not, or to, ver to look at how stratiform um, the, this rain band was. And so in order to do that, I um, did a vertical velocity CFADs, or 
contour frequency by altitude diagrams to get a sense of how uh, frequent these vertical velocities are within um, certain, uh, with the, at, with, at certain altitudes. And you can see that the bulk of these uh, vertical velocities uh, throughout the entire column are less than, uh, or on the order of one to two meters per second um, throughout the entire column in both uh, leg one and leg two, which are these two legs. And so that's pretty typical of stratiform precipitation. It's not active convection where you have strong vertical velocities. These are pretty weak, um, one to two meters per second. But uh, despite that uh, weak, uh, the, the weaker magnitude velocities, they're actually organized in terms of how much um, the, the air is being transported vertically. So the vertical mass transport shows us that um, this black solid line uh, has, shows that there's more upward transport um, above about four kilometers. Um, the melting level here was at about uh, four and a half, five kilometers. And below, uh, you have more, more downward transport. So the downward transport, or the upward transport is due to all of the latent heating um, from the residual convection. And the downward transport was due to the evaporation and melting cooling that occurred and that gives you a negatively buoyant mass of air that sinks. So you can see that this is, these two uh, characteristics, um, or these two plots, are typical characteristics of stratiform precipitation. And so I'd say, yeah, this is definitely stratiform, um, especially in leg one, whereas in leg two, it gets a little muddled. Um, you don't have very clear uh, downward uh, transport. But definitely in leg one, we've got a stratiform precipitation. And this is consistent with uh, past studies that have done these types of analysis of rain band precipitation uh, from like Henson House 2009. All right, so that's great. It typically looks like a stratiform that uh, is generated from convection. Even outside of tropical cyclones, you have these, um, this same signature. Now, if we did an azimuthal average of this uh, stratiform rain band, here we have the tangential velocity and the black contours are the reflectivity. So pretty clear bright band here, which is um, indicative of stratiform precip. Um, you have a higher uh, uh, tangential winds uh, here in the lower left portion. Now, we also can see the secondary circulation, so our vertical and radial circulation. If you look closely, there are there's pretty much a broad uh, descending inflow um, that goes into this band and a uh, very consistent uh, uh, upward and outflow. Um, so these are, this is actually the organization of that um, large upward transport above the melting level and a lot of downward transport below. And you can see that again in the radial velocity, this uh, rising outflow that's occurring. Um, so it's right going outward and it's rising in the vertical velocity. But um, and you also have your uh, mesoscale descending inflow that basically looks like a nose of air that comes right into the band. And then you can see it stops. And it looks like it descends into the boundary layer. In our boundary layer is where we typically have radial inflow that feeds the overall storm. So this really looks very similar to um, your typical, or it looks, to, looks like a, a, a trailing stratiform rain um, uh, kinematics and, micro and, and reflectivity structure that we see in uh, mesoscale convective systems. And in an MCS, we have our descending rear flow um, that is created underneath the stratiform uh, cloud uh, anvil. And you also have ascending front to rear flow, which looks like our radial outflow here. But what's missing is this huge convective tower and so what I uh, proposed was that the stratiform rain band, um, instead of having your convective source uh, on the left of uh, the rain band complex, it's actually upwind because down here is where we typically have more active convection. And then all of your ice particles are advected downwind. Um, and so you have a convection source that's upwind. I put question mark to let us know that I'm coming back to this. Um, and you also have uh, the ascending outflow, so latent heating within the stratiform cloud itself. And it's rising outward. Um, it's flowing outward because uh, the storm has to conserve angular momentum. So your angular momentum lines are actually just the same uh, 
curved outward uh, uh, direction as we have the flow going outward. And of course, below that, you have latent cooling due to melting, sublimation, evaporation. And that creates a horizontal buoyancy gradient that, uh, uh, or a meso low pressure that brings in the descending uh, inflow um, from, the, from environmental air. So that's pretty cool. And then we look downwind of that in leg two, you can see that that radio flow just became even stronger. Um, so this is a pretty large, uh, prominent feature. Uh, so much so that I expected it to impact the uh, intensity or the, the, the tangential wind structure of the storm. So uh, I analyzed the tangential, a couple of terms that I could get, that I could calculate from the aircraft observations. Um, so this is radio advection of the total vorticity um, and vertical advection. And, or sorry, this is radio flux. Um, and so if you looked at the total of those two terms, you could see that on this, this left plot looks at all of the, uh, the, the data between 50 and 120 kilometers. And you can see that uh, between two and six and up to 10 kilometers that you have a lot of acceleration, positive acceleration of the tangential wind. And when you go just outward, that increases even more. So this uh, inflow is, um, in other words, it's advecting <coughs> angular momentum inwards which is causing the spinning, spinning up of the tangential winds, um, which uh, we attribute, this, which we think is also attributed to uh, the expansion of the storm. Um, if you look closely at this rain band, uh, you also see that there are uh, lines of, uh, of, of uh, higher reflectivity. And so what I've done is I've looked at the composite along that suspicious uh, reflectivity max to get a sense of how stratiform is this really if you have this clear like, bands. Um, and what we saw was that this is actually due to elevated convection. So this descending inflow, uh, once it reaches a certain radius, it then shoots, some air shoots up, some air shoots down, and the air that uh, goes upward is what's actually creating um, that localized increase in, in precipitation. And this is all due to the stratiform processes themselves. So increased convection, increased convective activity uh, due to the, the mesoscale uh, stratiform processes. So if you put all this together um, in a conceptual model, what we found is that you have mesoscale uh, rising outflow that's associated with the latent heating, and you have mesoscale descending inflow that results from the buoyancy gradients and this is, uh, that causes the vortex wind field to broaden, and there's actually a tangential wind jet that I didn't show, but it's there in the mid-levels um, here at VT. And uh, following that, there's descending uh, air that goes into the boundary layer, and it locally enhances the boundary layer inflow. And that piece I've always uh, thought about was you have this broad mesoscale descending inflow that's going into the boundary layer. That has to do something to the overall storm structure and intensity because that's where the, the, the storm gets its energy from is the inflow of boundary layer air. Um, if you perturb that, then you're messing with the storm itself. Um, so what I wanted to do was figure out does that um, mesoscale descending inflow and its descent into the boundary layer, does it play a role in secondary eyewall formation? Well, luckily I had another storm case um, that I was able to look at um, that was Hurricane Earl in 2010, uh, which also created a secondary eyewall um, over the course of a couple days, or three days. And here we have, um, in this case, the, the shear vector rotated with time but the rain band complex still remained uh, relatively well aligned to, the, to that shear vector as it uh, uh, turned over time. And you can see that that rain band complex uh, became stronger um, until it created a clear uh, secondary eye wall. So this was actually one of the most, uh, this is from a recent paper as well. Uh, this was one of the most, uh, the, the, one of the best well sampled storms that we've ever had. There were four different field projects going on at this time that all flew their planes into the storm. And so there's a lot of data here. And what I'm going to show is, again, the uh, uh, tail Doppler radar. This one is from the NOAA P3. 
And uh, at about those times, um, there were four different flights. Uh, at, at about the times of this, the satellite data, there were four different flights, and we were able to look at um, the overall axisymmetric structure. And you can see, basically, the colors are the are the reflex, are the sorry, the tangential wind. You can see the inner eye wall uh, becoming stronger, of course, as it rapidly intensified. But if you look just outside of the inner eye wall, you can see the expansion of the wind field going from flights two to three. And then at flight four, there's a, a increasing uh, uh, low level tangential wind jet um, that started, that, that was a indicative of the creation of the secondary wind maximum and secondary eye wall. Now this is tangential wind. Um, you can see this is radial and vertical velocity. Uh, you have inflow that's going into this uh, developing secondary eye wall on the axis in the azimuthally average sense. And you have updrafts uh, that's basically showing you a nascent uh, overturning circulation for your uh, developing secondary eye wall. All right. so. What I did was I looked at this in four quadrants, of course. Um, we have our downstream left quadrant here. And uh, just showing the cross section of the data. Um, and in this quadrant, of course, is where we typically expect uh, our, our stratiform precipitation of the rain band complex. And here in radial velocity and vertical velocity, the gray contours are downdrafts. The gray dashed contours are downdrafts. You can see this clear descending inflow, um, and it actually was very prevalent uh, around the entire um, downstream left quadrant. So this is basically what we, what we saw in Rita, except now it's all going into the boundary layer. And we also see at the edge of this, at the entrance of this me mesoscale descending inflow going into the boundary layer, you have a clear updraft um, that's occurring. So here we have very clear conve active convection within what we typically call the stratiform part of the rain band complex. And uh, one uh, thing that we, we can think about this, uh, uh, what we can question about this is how important are um, co-pool dynamics um, in creating that active convection. So we know that in the MCS, this is a, a, a cold pool that is forcing the active convection on the leading edge as air flows in um, rel relative to the storm motion on the left side of your MCS. So one way to think about this is just uh, thinking about this air as being one huge negatively buoyant air parcel. And if you, uh, uh, an analogy to an electric field is that you have acceleration around, of the air around the air parcel in order to uh, compensate for that buoyancy. And so you can think about this air parcel as it's going, flowing inward. It's causing upward acceleration to the left and convergence above um, that air parcel, which is part, might likely due to, likely created all of this upward uh, motion um, just above this descending inflow. But once it gets into the boundary layer, then it, it this uh, taps into a very high theta E air that um, can erupt if there's a upward, um, if there's a, a, a sufficient amount of upward acceleration or convergence. And so that's what we think is going on here. Um, but the question, but the answer to my question is that it's kind of like the MCS, um, but not exactly because you have to remember that we have very strong uh, tangential flow. And what some of the preliminary results that I'm looking at now from modeling point of view is that um, the, you don't have uh, the air that's flowing and pinging upon the cold pool from the left. It's coming from uh, upwind. And that upwind flow interacts with the cold pool. But, um, and that is what's causing this updraft. But there are several caveats to that um, that are really interesting. I'd love to talk about that uh, if anybody has questions. <laughs> That was a joke. <laughs> um, so uh, on the next day, though, if you look at the downstream left quadrant again, um, you still have a very clear mesoscale descending inflow. So this feature is uh, pretty prominent in both uh, space and in terms of it being all in the downstream left quadrant. Um, and at the same time, it's 
pretty uh, prominent in terms of time. So this was uh, literally 12 hours later where you still have a very mesoscale descending inflow. And of course, you also have updraft uh, that's right here at the end of that uh, descending inflow. So we have a, a clear descending inflow that's um, there for a significant amount of time and that updraft that seems to be uh, responding to uh, this uh, descending inflow is also readily apparent um, at many, at, uh, over a long amount of time. What, how exactly does that compare to other uh, quadrants of the storm? Um, so in both flights two and three, um, the down to left quadrant, you can see that at, at larger radii, you have your nose of your inflow that starts to descend as we go from higher radii in the black to uh, lower radii in the dash. And we don't see that descending inflow feature um, very clearly in either of these uh, other three quadrants. And you see that again in flight three, but not in the downshear left, but not in the other quadrants. So it's definitely a downshear left um, phenomenon. And um, the, it's, it, even if, when it's a downshear left phenomenon, how is it changing the overall structure of the storm? And so to examine that, I looked at the, at the same terms, the radio flux of vorticity and vertical infection in the lowest levels to get a sense of how um, each quadrant is changing the axisymmetric tangential uh, winds. And it's pretty messy, but you can still see that this purple line is the downshear left. In flight two, um, you can see it's, uh, much lar it's larger than the other three quadrants in terms of their uh, contribution to the acceleration of the wind on flight two. In flight three, uh, it's both the downshear left and downshear right that are contributing to the overall um, acceleration um, at, at, the, at those radii. Um, but nevertheless, we can say that the downshear left has a prominent role in accelerating the low level tangential winds based on these two flights. And if you compare that to not necessarily the, the calculations of the budget, but the actual uh, change that occurred between the two flights. You can see that the downshear left between flight three and two um, had the largest increase in tangential winds. Um, and that's, of course, where we saw the, the largest acceleration. And in, from flight four to flight three, uh, the downshear right and the downshear left uh, have uh, uh, the strongest, the highest uh, change. So these um, actual changes uh, correspond roughly well to uh, the budgets that were calculated. And if we go on to flight four, remember this is what I showed before, is that you have our, at around 100 uh, kilometers radius, which is also where we saw our strongest uh, acceleration. That's where you see the development of the secondary wind maximum and overturning circulation. Now, just looking at the four different quadrants of this um, flight here, uh, we have, again, the radial and vertical velocity. And you, you can see, compared to the other quadrants, is that the downshear left has inflow, of course, uh, in the boundary layer. But then you have this really uh, significant updraft and outflow. So it's a very clear overturning circulation in the downshear left quadrant. Um, compared to the other three quadrants. There is an overturning circulation here in the downshear right, deeper inflow and still updraft and outflow above. But what it doesn't have that the downshear left has is a clear uh, secondary wind maximum in that quadrant alone. And the downshear left actually had the strongest uh, secondary wind maximum and overturning circulation. So there's something about this uh, downshear left quadrant exclamation point. Um, it's pretty important. And if we compare this to um, other observations, um, so this is a recent paper from my uh, student, my former student. Um, uh, what, uh, what, what Katie did was she looked at uh, flight level data from a composite of 33 um, cases uh, that had secondary eyewall formation. And we normalized them to radii uh, of the secondary wind maximum that developed. And what we found was that when you go from before a clear secondary eyewall to when there is a clear secondary eyewall, and you look at the difference in the tangential winds, you can see that the downshear left, which is the blue here, 
it has the largest increase in the tangential wind quadrants on a composite scale of 33 storms. So um, the downstream left has that largest uh, increase um, relative to the other quadrants at the radius of secondary eye wall, which was uh, R2. So our single case um, is consistent with uh, this composite of, uh, of several storms. Um, other uh, comparisons uh, to um, my paper on just the secondary eye wall. So this is the actually symmetric um, uh, uh, vertical velocity and radial winds in, um, in Hurricane Rita. And you can see that here we have clear inflow. There is inflow there, trust me. And it, 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 once it goes above the boundary layer, there's outflow that does a little zigzag, but it continues as going outward um, up, uh, at higher altitudes. And then you have a very strong updraft. So here in the downstream left, uh, that uh, overturning circulation uh, looked most like this axisymmetric um, secondary eyewall uh, circulation. So. The downstream left looks like a secondary eye wall, while the other quadrants don't necessarily look as similar um, to the axisymmetric secondary eye wall of, of Hurricane Rita. And um, if you compare this to other storms, um, this is a composite, or from Hinta House 2012A, this is a composite of um, trim precipitation radar reflectivity. And she, uh, what she looked at, Deanna looked at, was uh, how the reflectivity is distributed around a concentric eye wall um, structure. So she looked at several storms as well over the trim life uh, cycle. And what she found was that the downstream left quadrant here in the secondary wind eye wall had the highest reflectivity um, compared to the other quadrants. I have left of shear here, but it really is in this downstream left quadrant. So we have a consistent um, reflectivity maximum um, in a mature secondary eye wall, which is also where we found our downshear left um, rain band complex and, and, and convection that was triggered in, in Hurricane Earl. And this structure uh, was, uh, this was just with reflectivity. And if, uh, what I looked at was from Gonzalo, um, uh, uh, actual uh, kinematic data um, from a couple of eye wall replacement cycles that Gonzalo underwent in 2014. And what I found was that, yes, the downstream left quadrant has the, sec the strongest secondary um, circulation, so strongest updraft and strongest inflow and tangential wind max when you have a mature, a mature secondary eye wall there. And so uh, these two cases, uh, so Earl on the left and Gonzalo on the right, are also um, consistent with each other in telling us that the downstream left quadrant um, is it seems to be pretty important on uh, secondary eye wall formation. So um, to conclude with Earl, um, what we found was that the mesoscale descending inflow persistently occurs in the stratiform downstream left quadrant. And this extends into the boundary layer, which likely triggers um, an, an updraft that is adjacent and persistent. Um, and, and this inflow and updraft uh, contributes pretty strongly to uh, the increasing the, the tangential winds there, and that uh, helps develop a local tangential wind max when you have a mature second when you have a mature rain band complex where stratiform precipitation is always in the left of shear uh, half. But over time, uh, that downshear left um, these downshear left processes uh, can sufficiently spark the axisymmetric dynamics um, that would develop a secondary eye wall um, over time. So all that to say is downstream left is where it starts. I think it's the most important. And uh, we're currently doing some more modeling studies to, uh, to see if these hypotheses are, um, are worth anything. So in summary, uh, the dual pole radar um, will certainly help us advance our knowledge of tropical cyclone microphysics. For example, the stratiform uh, in all convection is, uh, needs to be uh, better tuned in, in all of the modeling. And this is also important in, in tropical cyclone modeling because of the most the importance of that stratiform rain band um, in the overall evolution of the storm. Uh, so I talked about the current theories not being uh, fully, ex doesn't, that they don't fully explain the role of the rain band convection in um, secondary eyewall formations. 
So what I'm proposing is that the mesoscale descending inflow, um, which is a recurring feature in the downstream left uh, rain band complex, shows us a plausible way for the rain bands to transition into a mature secondary eye wall. Um, and this is through both uh, the expansion of the wind field and also creating uh, the low level vorticity anomalies um, that initiate other axisymmetric uh, theories that we talked that I talked about earlier. And this is, of course, important to understanding the dynamics um, for, uh, of the storm um, so that we can improve our knowledge and forecasting of um, eyewall replacement cycles. So uh, with that, thank you all for listening. Yeah, so you definitely wouldn't have the, a stronger cold pool um, with, with, if you turned the evaporation off. Um, I know that there have been a few studies already that have shown the, that when you switch off the different um, latent cooling mechanisms, um, that does impact the cold pool. And they have shown that um, secondary eye walls do tend to form more frequently when the cooling is all kept on. Um, and but that's from an axisymmetric point of view. And so that does support um, some of the theories that I'm showing here. Um, one of my uh, students right now is also looking at the cold pool dynamics. Um, if you want it, so what I was proposing was that the ta tangential wind flow impinges upon the, the cold pool. But in order for that to happen, the, the brain band has to not be rotating. Um, so what he's found, some of his uh, preliminary findings is that the rotation rate of the rain band complex, if there is rotation, then there's less likely um, uh, convergence with the cold pool, and so less um, updraft as a result. But when you keep it fixed, which is what we typically find with uh, consistent wind shear, um, then that would create more updrafts. Yes, so uh, why does the Mesa's descending motion mm -hmm. prefer to occur in the down uh, shear left cold uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's about, oh, I didn't mention that. <laughs> um, so one, uh, that's a theory, one theory for explaining why we have the rain band complex aligned with the wind shear is that uh, the convection gets generated to the right of shear uh, because the overall vortex gets tilted um, slightly down shear. And so when you have that tilt in the vortex, then in the lower levels on the right of shear is where you have more low level vorticity. So you have a positive low level vorticity anomaly. And the shear also distorts the overall moisture field um, such that that right of shear uh, location um, has both um, enough moisture and a vorticity anomaly that generates the convection. And so since the convection is actively generated on one side of the storm, then it basically the exhaust or the dying of that convection gets uh, the positive downwind in the downshore left. Yeah, secondary eyewall is relatively rare. Um, I see often in the major hurricanes. So what do you mean by relatively rare? <coughs> So there have been several studies that have looked at um, satellite um, imagery, so the, bright, the, the brightness temperature the images that I showed. Um, and they've actually found that uh, for stronger storms, so if we just looked at category three or higher storms, up to 50% of um, storms over the course of their lifetime do uh, go, undergo an eyewall replacement cycle. Um, this is from uh, worldwide, um, storms worldwide. So it's, it's rare in terms of um, 
at the sense of hurricanes being a rare phenomenon in, in general across the entire world. But in terms of major hurricanes, it's actually pretty common. Okay, so that's 50%. Yeah, it's okay. on the order of 40 to 60. What about the other yeah. half? Other uh, 50% of which we do not see the secondary eye wall. Does that mean this, this uh, similar, same or similar series does not apply to those half? We, can, we do not see the secondary eye wall. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Yeah, we see 50% of the secondary eye wall. Mm -hmm. What about the other 50% we do not see? The right, the so it's possible that they're there but um, they're just not observed by the overpasses of the satellite. Yeah. Uh, so related to that, does it depend upon, so you talked about the vector, shear vector, but does it depend upon the magnitude of the shear? Yes. So it's um, possible, I mean, not all these storms are going in the same shear, but it depends on magnitude, right? So. Right, so that's definitely a, a point of, of um, uh, a source of, of, of a lot of studying is trying to understand what mag what is the magnitude of the shear have on whether or not a storm is going to create a secondary eye wall. So that leads to the question of why do they occur in the first place? Um, we found that the lower the shear, then the less. Well, there have been a, there's been a couple studies that have shown that the lower the shear, then that you tend to see less secondary eye walls that are formed. If the shear is about moderate, then it's uh, then like five to 15 meters per second, then that's where secondary eye walls tend to form more often. But then if the shear is too strong, then that just uh, disturbs the entire circulation. So, the, maybe the question. so in these axis symmetric models, when they don't have any shear, mm -hmm. um, I know they're not highly idealized, but can you get a secondary eye wall with them? Yes, you can. Um, so they do occur because they're, this is just one plausible pathway. Um, so there are other pathways that are possible, but um, this one is driven by shear, which is uh, something that's off pretty much seen in a lot of storms. But there's definitely other um, factors. So if you don't have shear, then you can have uh, um, you can have other perturbances in the upper levels that create like momentum fluxes and axisymmetric sense um, that can create a secondary eye wall circulation as well. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so uh, I think we should probably move on to lunch and maybe continue with some more questions there. So let's uh, thank Anthony one last time.